So, um, this is, I think, the biggest talk of the class. Um, so, we're going to start with um, what is a TPM? What does it do? Um, then we're going to get into it, and this, by the way, is a probably half the presentation. Because after all, if you don't know what it is and what it, what it does, telling you about what it's good for is not actually very helpful. Um, then we're going to talk about what it's good for and, and where we can use it. We're going to cover some TPM myths, because there are a lot of these floating around the world. Um, and what the actual truth is that, that caused these myths to exist. And then we're going to talk a little bit at the end as to why enterprises and, and other large-scale organizations should care about TPMs. Um, why they are actually meaningful in these large-scale contexts in a way that they rarely are in like a home user context. And this is all going to be at a pretty high level because we're going to start doing a deep dive this afternoon. So, um, what is a TPM? Uh, TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. These are extremely inexpensive chips. These are usually cost about less than a dollar. Um, and they are on almost every motherboard today. Um, they're not in Macs, at least not as far as anyone can tell. They used to be. Apple stopped concluding them. Um, and servers uh, don't reliably have them. Most servers can have them, but they're treated as an add-on, not a default in some brands. Um, they serve as a hardware root of trust for the platform. Um, yeah, no TPM and Max. <laughs> so, um, we trust the secrets that it holds. Um, we can use it as a root of trust for platform state when combined with something called a root of trust for measurement, which we'll get into in a lot more detail in a moment. Um, and for platform identity. When we talk about TPM today, we are generally talking about 1.2 TPMs. That's the current version. They've been out for, gosh, about five years now. Um, and unless otherwise specified, that is what we're going to be talking about. There are 1.1 TPMs that do exist. They're pretty rare these days. They didn't get widespread um, adoption. And at this point, those machines are pretty old. And there is a TPM 2.0 that is coming down the pipeline. The specification for that is going to be released sometime this year. Um, we'll see how, when that gets adopted. But for right now, everything I'm going to be talking about, by, you know, when I talk about TPMs do this, I mean a 1.2 TPM does this. And even once 2.0 comes out, it's going to have a 1.2 mode to support a lot of this. So your assumptions will generally hold true. It just has some extra features. So, What's in a TPM? Um, this is a very high-level diagram. Uh, if you actually go look at the TPM spec, you'll get a much more detailed one picture of the bus. Most people really don't care to that level. Um, but it has some non-volatile memory, which is to say an internal state that will stick around over, over reboots. Some volatile memory, which is where it holds things that are only for, for this particular boot. Um, its own cryptographic code processor. Um, a lot of people say, great, the TPM has a cryptographic code processor. I can use it for all my crypto applications. You really don't want to. I did say this chip costs less than a dollar. It's not exactly speedy. Um, it also has its own execution engine where it can perform various <coughs> operations. Um, that are um, internal but not necessarily cryptographic. Uh, and it has a random number generator. So most people don't care about that. They care about what the TPM provides to them. What can we use it for? So first off, we can use it as a root of trust for reporting. Um, we can use it as a root of trust for storage. And there's some limited internal storage. For example, um, it, it has a set of something special called platform configuration registers, as well as some key storage and some generic data storage. Um, it also does random number generation. And there are a number of 
cryptographic functions that it exports. These are highly constrained, uh, but generally this is a feature, not a bug. They are trying to make sure you don't accidentally do something insecure. Of course, many people do actually want to do insecure things routinely, so trade-offs. Um, so we will talk, I believe, very briefly about 2.0 later on. Um, the main thing that 2.0 does is they're taking a lot of the concepts of 1.2 and trying to make them a little more flexible and a little bit less fragile. So 1.2 only has, sorry, the question here is, so if 2.0 does the function very differently from 1.2, I'd appreciate some mention of that. I'll try and cover it in passing, but in general, when 1.2 says there is only one way to do X, 2.0 often says, well, you can do it in way X, but you can also do it in way Y that a lot of people have requested. So 2.0 generally has more flexibility uh, than 1.2. It's generally a little larger. Um, so for the most part, the concepts of 2.0 are going to be the same as what we're covering today. Um, it's the implementation details that tend to vary wildly. We'll, we'll get to NVRAM in, in, in a little while, but yes, you, you can write to it. It's just that it is not. Uh, the volatile memory really is generally erased on boot and reset to specific state on boot. Non-volatile memory is not permanent, it's just not volatile, it, you have to change it deliberately. That's one of the things you can do with a non-volatile memory, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little while. So, roots of trust. We keep saying root of trust over and over and over again. So, what we mean by that is these are the things that you base all of your trust on. That thing that you, you trust blindly. Um, we have no way to verify a root of trust directly. Um, this is one of the reasons we like having standards. So we can say, well, we believe that the TPM will act as a root of trust in this area because I've looked at the standard and I know how it will behave if it is actually a TPM. Um, in general, we trust the chip because we trust that the manufacturer, when the manufacturer said it meets the specification, um, it is worth noting that this means that when we talk about we can trust TPMs, we're trusting the TPM manufacturers. One of the questions we get a lot is, is there a trusted foundry producing TPMs? And the answer is not yet, at least not as far as anybody's told me. So your mileage may vary. Um, also, there is no such thing as generic trust. I might trust you to save my life if I'm dying, but not with my bank account. And similarly, um, I trust my TPM to protect my data. I can't trust it to verify that my antivirus is working. It, doesn't, it can't do that. So we're going to dig down a little bit and not just say we trust the TPM, but what do we trust it for? So the first root of trust that the TPM provides us is the root of trust for reporting. And this root of trust gets the, the basic question is my system in a good state? Or one point, is this system in a good state? Um, in order to answer that question, we actually have to break it down into two parts. Um, which component looked at the system state and evaluated? That's the root of trust for measurement, because it's measuring the system state. And what told us the reports in a way that we could believe? That's the root of trust for reporting. Um, and these are, unfortunately, different components. The TPM is a root of trust for reporting. We believe whatever we, we can generally believe that it will accurately tell us whatever is stored inside it. It is not the root of trust for measurement. TPMs have no visibility into the machine that they are in. So it can't act as a root of trust for measurement. We'll get into what does in a little while. A root of trust for storage um, answers the question, are these secrets kept secret? And the TPM is a root of trust for storage. It does not actually store every secret directly. Um, it stores one secret, which is technically actually the root of trust for storage, not the TPM, um, that is used to protect all of the other secrets. So it's a root of trust that is not the only thing that we trust. Um, you can build a key hierarchy where you have this one 
It's called a storage root key. And it encrypts another storage key, which then encrypts a bunch of data. That data is still securely protected by a storage key, which is protected by the TBM, which is why we call this a root of trust for storage. <clears throat> so we'll dig a lot more deeply into that later on today. Um, the TPM also has in its limited internal storage this special thing called platform configuration registers, which is where we get into measurement. Um, so PCRs are 20 byte registers, which is to say, remember how I said SHA-1 hashes are, are 20 bytes long? This is why these are 20 byte registers. Um, today, TPMs tend to have 24. The specification actually says at least 24 for PC client TPMs, which is the only ones that actually exist. Realistically, these are cheap parts. Nobody puts in anything more than they have to. We've yet to see a TPM that has more than 24 PCRs. The old TPMs, the 1.1s, have 12. The 2.0 TPMs um, actually have this fancy architecture where you can, you can independently create new ones as you need them, which is kind of special. Um, PCRs are used to store system measurements. Um, although you can put other things in them, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the other things you can do with them later today. Um, PCRs are really cool because they are extremely constrained. You cannot overwrite a PCR. They are always reset at boot to a known value. For most of them, this is all zeros. For some of them, this is all ones. Um, and when you store data in one, it does not overwrite the current context. Instead, you use what's called an extend operation, which hashes the new data you want to put into the PCR with what is currently there. So it is doing a hash of both the old data and the new data, which means that the new contents of the register reflect all of its history, including what you just added to it. There's no way to erase the history and go back without doing what's called a reset operation. We're going to go into that in more detail later. Um, PCRs do have a concept of permissions. It's pretty primitive. Um, they are based on something called locality, which if you're familiar with the idea of, of OS rings, that's the closest equivalent there is to locality. I'll be honest, very few people use locality. It is mostly used at the very low level to identify the root of trust for, for measurement. We'll get into some of that later today. Fundamentally, you can, you can usually ignore this. But just so you know, there is a permission structure on PCRs if you are trying to do certain fancy things where you can, you can limit the access to it at, at, a, at a very low level. Um, now, the advantage to this extend operation that I talked about, where we're hashing the, the old value with the new value, is that if I want to verify what's in your PCRs, I need to know everything that was in them for the entire history, which means that I can check very easily that this is the correct PCR, and this is everything that's been added to it. And it's very hard for an adversary to forge a desired target value, because you have to start with a known value and you have to extend it at a certain time. If you get in early enough, if you're the first person to extend it, you can put whatever you want in, but the measurement architecture we've got makes that very difficult at the low level. So we can establish trust because a verifier can step through and make sure that all of the values extended into this register are the ones that they expect. Yeah, the time it always goes, goes back to zero or one. It's not actually one, it's f, 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 but yes. It, it's a hash chain. Um, for the most part, in real world applications, most PCRs are only extended a few times, but that's just because it's the system design. Um, there is one program that I know of, uh, IBM's Integrity Measurement Architecture, that does in fact extend a hash of every single program that executes 
at, you know, at, at execution into a PCR, and you, you do in fact often get hundreds of measurements being extended in if you're running IMA. You need to keep very detailed logs at that point in order to do the verification, but you can do it. There's nothing stopping you. The, T the TPM doesn't keep those audit logs. It doesn't care how many times you've extended it. It has a simple mathematical operation. It will do it as many times as you want. So the TPM is not a root of trust for measurement. It has no visibility into the system state, so it can't tell you is the system good or not without something else helping it. The root of trust for measurement needs to be capable of inspecting the system, or because it's actually a root of trust for measurement and not actually the only thing responsible for measurement, it needs to be capable of inspecting at least some part of the system that can then be used to, to inspect other parts of the system. There are two roots of trust for measurement today. The first is the BIOS. And technically, it's not even the entire BIOS. It's the BIOS boot block. Um, we refer to this as the static root of trust for measurement, or the SRTM, because it never changes, um, and because what it measures never changes. There's also uh, a C special CPU mode. It's got some special operations. You launch into it with something called S in it, or SK in it, or S ender. Um, that is called the dynamic root of trust for measurement. Um, and we're going to go into how these work and what these do in much more detail later. But for now, what you need to know is what these do is they place a set of initial measurements into a PCR and then hand off control to whatever component they've measured. And in general, we then expect that component to measure the next piece into a PCR and proceed. This is what we call a chain. The root of trust for measurement, put it in, some other components have booted and added measurements to PCRs. What do we do with them? Well, the TPM does give us the ability to just read them, but that's not exactly a trustworthy operation. I, I can read the report. It's in a file on my file system. I can hand that to you, but how do you know that actually came from a TPM? You, you really don't. So what we have instead is an operation called a quote. This is a signed report from the TPM that contains the hash of the current PCR values. And you can actually narrow it down a little bit if you don't want to use somebody all 24. In practice, we very rarely see people actually narrowing it down. Um, it also uses a nonce, like we talked about earlier this morning, to prove that that quote is fresh, which means that we can hand a quote to another party and say, these are the values of my registers right now. Um, it is a hash of whichever ones you request. Okay. You can say, I only want PC, a report of PCR 0 through 5. In general, today, most people just request all 24 because they don't. It is a single hash of all of them. Um, so quotes are one of the most powerful tools we've got for state reporting because we can verify who it came from because the TPM signed it. We can verify that it's current because the TPM actually incorporated that nonce into the signed report. And we can use that, that plain readout of the PCRs to verify the hash of the PCRs that's been signed. And now we know what values are in those registers. Maybe we have an additional audit log. If we do have something like IMA running where we've got hundreds of values. And we can say, now we know what the values of the registers are, and we can build from our trust and whatever the root of trust for measurement is, we can evaluate the system and say, is it good or not? This is a tremendously powerful tool. Not as powerful as we would always like, but very useful. There are a few other things we can do with the TPM's PCRs. Um, 
if we want to encrypt data, we can seal that data or bind it via a related mechanism um, to a set of PCR values so that they are decryptable only when the PCRs match some target value. So if we know what a good system looks like, we can encrypt data so it is only openable by a good system. Um, and I will note, one of the things that, that PCRs can be used for, that's a little, a little unusual and a little bit out there, is we've talked about PCRs for system measurements, but we've seen people do things like say, I'm going to extend a password into a PCR so that I know that, that you know, I must have input that password in order for my data to be decrypted. And you know, maybe I don't know anything else about the system, but if somebody else steals my laptop and opens it up, they can't create that arbitrary PCR value because they don't know what went into it. So I can actually lock data to me personally. There's a lot of things. You, know, you can also create bound data with a key that has password in it. So that particular use is not necessarily what most people want. But there are other things you can do by taking advantage of the fact that this is a register. You can extend it with whatever you want. And then you can lock data to it. Um, Keys, um, any, almost any TPM key can be constrained so that it can only be used when a specific set of PCR values are present. Um, and that, that key is then only usable when the values match. But I can say, when I find this data, you know what the values of the PCR registers are. When I encrypted this data, you know when the, what the values of the PCRs are. Um, and as I said, you can store things that are not measurement data in PCRs like passwords or other you know, arbitrary value indicating I have passed some system threshold. So there are things you can do with it. Um, the only way to wipe out, a, there's two ways to wipe out PCRs. The reliable way to do it is you reboot the machine. All PCRs return to that set value on reboot. The second is that some PCRs, not most of them, but a few of them, are what's called resettable. And we'll get to this in a little while. Those PCRs can be freely restored to, a, to an empty plate at any point in time. We use that for certain operations where we want transient reporting. Um, but you wouldn't use that for measurement data like this in general because you you, know, you can't build up a chain of trust through those PCRs. That said, there's only about five or six of those out of 24. <laughs> oh, you're funny. You, you presume that we have a reliable answer for that. Um, so the short answer is we don't really know. The best we've got today in terms of practical solutions for how do I know what PCR values are good is, well, I've taken this machine. I've installed good software on it. I've done a report on this machine. If anything changes, I'll notice. Yes. Okay. Um, there are, there's a bunch of research into more specifics, um, but fundamentally PCRs so the thing about PCR values is PCRs are hashes, and frequently they're hashes of hashes. Hashes are very volatile. If I change one bit, my hash is going to change. So what that means is that if I take, you know, if my copy of Windows updates its timestamp in the kernel, Let's just change the hash. So I have a lot of people who, who really want these to be magic bullets that will, you know, we have measurement A if Windows is good, measurement B if Windows is bad. And the answer is, this is like a face recognition system that doesn't recognize you if you change your shirt. Like, this is not really very resilient today. There's a whole lot of research going on in making it more resilient and more reliable so that we can predict values better. Um, there's some, there's some, a bunch of work going on in terms of like making BIOSes hold to some standards for how they do that initial measurement 
so we can get a better sense of, of what biases are measuring and what orders we can get consistent values at, which we don't have today. Um, two, two different machines with the same BIOS will produce completely different inter initial measurements, and we only sort of know why. Um, and there's work going on to, you know, how do I, as an enterprise, establish a set of good values that I would trust. That said, right now, the best we can say is these are fragile. They're very powerful. They're very fragile. Use them when you really can. So, um, that's the, the platform configuration registers. No, notice I will not go in that volatile memory area. There's two other kinds of, of storage that the TPM has that we use frequently, which is storage for keys and storage for data. I believe we have a question, so I'm going to pause briefly to... So you can't reclaim... So, so um, storing passwords... Are, so you don't store data in a PCR with intent to retrieve it. That's not what PCRs are for. Uh, so, sorry, the question is, back up to storing passwords or other data in a PCR, how can the passwords or data be reclaimed by restoring the, the PCRs to a previous state? PCRs are special storage. They are storage of state records only. They are not meant to be used for, for data storage and retrieval. We'll get to, to, to those sections next, conveniently. So, um, in terms of key storage, there's really two categories of keys in the TBA. The first is the TPM's root keys. There are exactly two keys that never, ever, ever leave the TPM. There's absolutely no operation you can do to the TPM that doesn't involve an acid bath that will cause these, these keys to leave the TPM. The first is the endorsement key. Um, this is the root of trust for reporting. It is the key that we use to build trust eventually in those quotes that we were talking about, among other things. Now, the endorsement key is a special little beast. Um, it is only directly used to certify another kind of key called an attestation identity key or an identity key or an AIK. Um, these are sometimes also called anonymous identity keys, which is wrong, which is why we don't use them anymore. They are not anonymous at all. They are pseudonymous, which is a subtle but important distinction. Um, but it is important to note that when I, as a remote party, say, I am trusting the TPM, I believe this is a TPM key. All of my trust in that key being a TPM key, in the, in the basic design of the system, comes down to I trust the endorsement key, and from there I can build trust in any other key that the TPM ever provides. The second is a storage root key. Um, this is the root of trust for storage. This key is only used to protect keys and other data via encryption. And it, of course, decrypts them when, when reloading them. Um, it can protect other storage keys, so we can create hierarchies of data protection. Those storage keys can also encrypt other keys. So when we talk about the storage root key, we, we don't mean this is the only key you will ever use for storage, although for most systems today, that is what we see. If you only need to protect a handful of things, you don't really need a complicated hierarchy. But fundamentally, um, this is the root of trust for storage because it is what protects all other keys, if only indirectly by protecting the key that protects that, that data. Um, if there's a way to make a complicated hierarchy out of something that could be simple, the TPM will take it. Um, so there are lots of other TPM keys. Every single one of them is, has their private components, the private has encrypted using the SRK and, or some other storage key and is returned to the user. So the user has what's called a key blob um, and these are stored outside the TPM on disk by default most of the time, whereas only these two keys are always stored within the, the TPM no matter what. So there are a lot of kinds of non-root keys in the TPM. We're going to get into this in a lot more detail later today. But at a high level, there are keys that are used for encryption and decryption, and there are a completely separate set of keys that are used for signing or, sorry about the typo, reporting. Um, and note, there are no keys that are used for both encryption and decryption and for signing or reporting, except these legacy keys, 
which we really do not recommend using. They're not really TPM keys. The TPM will happily import legacy keys, but that's not really what it's for. The TPM really wants you to not double up on the uses of various keys because there are attacks that can happen because in RSA, those operations are actually the same. So if you use the same key for both, you can be potentially deceived into, into signing something you didn't need to. <coughs> um, we'll get into to what those are mostly later. So as I said before, all of this variety of encryption keys and signing keys and identity keys um, are stored in the blob on the disk. Um, I didn't name it. <laughs> I'm sorry. These are also called wrap keys, but fundamentally they're key blobs. Um, the private key is encrypted along with some integrity protection, and then there's a large public section that includes the public key and general information about the key. What type of key is it? How long is it? That sort of thing. Um, only the TPM that created it by default can decrypt it. When you create a key, you just designate it either as migratable or non-migratable. A migratable key is one that can be exported off of this machine, uh, out of this TPM. Um, any other key is non-migratable, which means that for the lifetime of this key, it's never going to be usable outside of this platform and this platform's TPM. And there's no way to take a non-migratable key and make it migratable, or vice versa. So, we can, and, and whether a key is migratable or not is part of that key data that, that people can read. And there's a way that we can actually certify that so a, a remote party knows. Now, both of these are tremendously useful if I want to do backups, for example. It's often very handy to have a migratable key that I can send off of the platform. But when we're talking about identities, we really do tend to, to really want non-migratable keys because I don't want my TPM's identity leaving. That, that sort of would defeat the purpose. So these blobs are what's called loaded back into the TPM to be used, at which point the TPM decrypts them and puts them in volatile memory uh, temporarily where they can be used. And they will stay in the TPM while there is space remaining. And how much space there is depends on the individual TPM. They do have limited internal space for keys. Realistically, in most applications we've seen today, this has not been much of a constraint, but most of the applications we've seen today have one or two keys. If we started to get into scenarios where you had 20, you would start seeing the TPM actually swapping keys out, at which point you would have to reload the ones you're looking for. Um, you can, if you are the TPM owner, and we'll get to that, what that means in a minute, say, this particular key that has been loaded already, that is currently loaded into the TPM, is permanently going to stay there. It can be very useful for certain operations. If I want to, to have a key in there that you know, the BIOS can use to unlock my hard drive, and I just want it to stay in the TPM and, and not have to worry about the loading operations, we can do that. Keep in mind the TPM's internal space is limited. So the more keys that you permanently lock into the TPM, the less space you'll have for advance. So trade-offs. In addition to that key storage, the TPM also has data storage. And the data storage tends to be in that non-volatile storage. Because this, is, this tends to be stuff we want to store over multiple boots. So, the NVRAM is actually very flexible. It's an area of storage which can be allocated in, in pretty arbitrary chunks by the machine owner, or by the TPM owner. Um, and the owner can establish permissions for each of those regions. And the it read permissions and write permissions are set separately. Um, and you can say, this area is accessible only to the TPM owner. This area is accessible only when certain PCR values are present. This area is accessible only if you have a certain authorization value, which is to say a password. Um, and that's a pretty flexible infrastructure. In 2.0, we're starting to see it even more flexible. Uh, we had that question, so to what does TPM 2.0 give us? 
Uh, 2.0 has much more NVRAM. And among other things, you can set regions of 2.0 NVRAM to act like a PCR. Um, and you can set more flexible permissions and policies here. Um, but fundamentally, the thing you need to know about NVRAM is that you can actually say things like, this area of NVRAM, the owner might put the hash of the owner's private key in, or the hash of the owner's public key in, so that later on when I say, I'm going to make sure the owner approved this, I know it's actually the owner's key. I've got a public key on disk, I can check the hash, it's the same key, therefore I know the owner approved it. Um, it is worth noting that NVRAM is very tiny. You are only obliged to have 1024 bits of this stuff, and some of it's already reserved. So don't do anything too, yeah, don't think that you can store, you know, a boot sector in here, or your, your reliable, you know, some core piece of software. In general, this is so small, you mostly see it used for integrity checking at best, because you can fit quite a few hashes in 1K of memory, and not very much else. Um, part of NVRAM is also set aside for certificate storage, because according to the TCG's design, the manufacturer may provide credentials for the TPM, and that is the obvious place to put them. Um, they almost certainly didn't. Theoretically, they're there. In reality, they're a unicorn. I've heard reports they exist. I've never seen one. Okay, so jumping back to our big high-level topic here. We've talked about um, key storage, or all of the TPM's internal storage now. Let's go into some of the, the what I might call miscellany, the other useful features that the TPM provides. Yes? We're going to get to how those are, are provisioned later. Uh, that's complicated. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> I, I wish there were a simple answer for you. They are stored it separately. The, the, that 1024 bits of NVRAM is its, its own region. Okay. It, the, the region that the root keys are stored in is also non-volatile, but it's not considered part of the NVRAM for NVRAM operations. There's nothing you can do to set that to read, for example. Yeah. It's completely segregated. Okay. So, um, the TPM is required to have an internal random number generator, um, which is strongly encouraged but not required to include hardware entropy sources. So, TPMs are required to have an internal random number generator. Um, the quality of this random number generator is not actually defined in the spec. It's supposed to be good, it's supposed to be indistinguishable from random, even though you could theoretically use a pseudo-random number generator, but they don't recommend it. Exactly how good they are, you know, I get a lot of people saying, so how good is the TPM's random number generator? And the answer is, we don't know. The TPM manufacturer knows, they're not telling us. Go ask the manufacturer if you, if you, if you care deeply. Um, in general, we tend to find them perfectly suitable for most day-to-day -day purposes. Um, most of them do appear to use some kind of hardware entropy generator based on the fact that I can run them out of entropy and they take quite a while, a while to build up enough to, for example, generate new keys. Um, if you are somebody who cares deeply about high security requirements where you have minimum number, you know, certain quality of entropy that you care about, the TPM actually does allow you to add externally provided entropy to their random number generator. They have a, a, a basically a stir command where you add extra bits and it stirs it all together. So that if you do have, for example, a lava lamp that's generating entropy for you, you can't actually stick that in the TPM. Um, the TPM's internal random number generator is what it uses to generate all of its TPM keys, and they're actually nonces that the TPM uses itself for transactions with software. So there are reasons that you may want to do this, even if it's good enough for most purposes. Um, and also, if you do want random bits, you can ask the TPM for them. And generally, this is probably going to be better, although slower, than, for example, your OS's random. So, uh, Zeno, that's a very good question. It's one that I actually want to test. If you want to, to uh, sorry, Zeno's question is, so what happens if you store in a bunch of non-random bits, like zeros, what happens? Um, given that it is a stir, I'm not sure. And I really would love to test that with you if you want to set up some experiments. Um, I, I don't have good information as to how to test 
entropy, but I'm sure that this exists somewhere. Um, so Matthew asked, other than the access control enforcing the fact that you have to have certain PCR values, I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, um, is there a relationship between a, the PCRs and the storage of the private part of the TPM key storage? So are you asking, um, is there, other than are the PCRs identical? Are there any other constraints on the private parts of TPM key storage? I'm not sure I'm quite understanding the question. So the PCRs don't actually enforce anything about the keys except when they can be used. Um, so the all TPM keys are RSA keys. You set the number of bits that they are when you create them along with a whole bunch of other factors. Um, any given key has only certain operations it can be used for. That's part of what the key type is. Whenever I attempt to use a key, so for example, if I have a signing key and I go to sign data, when the sign operation is executed, the TPM looks at the current PCR values, looks at any PCR constraints on the key, and says, do these, are the constraints met? Now, you don't have to add PCR constraints to a key, and you can only constrain to certain subsets of PCRs, but fundamentally, all it's doing is basically an equality check on use based on whatever constraints you've assigned it. So, um, and you can also add other things like authorization values to keys, which we'll, we'll get to later. But that's the only time that the PCRs really matter when it comes to key usage. Um, did that answer your question? Awesome. Those are defined when you create the key, and we'll go into that in a lot more detail later today when we talk about creating keys. I'm sorry to be pushing so many of your questions off, but you're jumping around a lot anyway. Um, so TPM also provides, in addition to what we talked about earlier with the quote, a whole bunch of useful but very specialized cryptographic functionality. Um, you can encrypt and decrypt data with the TPM. Unfortunately, it does not have a generic encrypt or decrypt operation. Um, this is not designed for bulk encryption or decryption. See previous note about export control laws. Um, instead, it provides two different operations, um, technically three. One is sealing and the corresponding unsealing, which are encrypting or decrypting data for use on this same TPM. This is basically local only encrypt and decrypt operations. There's also a, a unbind operation. The corresponding bind operation is performed only in software, not in the TPM, where you decrypt data, usually from some remote party, although you could do it locally if you wanted to. Um, and here it is basically a generic, this is as close as the TPM gets to a generic decrypt operator. You're using a slightly specialized format, but it is decrypting data with the TPM key. You use different kinds of keys for those two operations. Um, the TPM also lets you sign data. Um, in certain constrained data formats, there's not a generic sign any arbitrary data. You can either sign things in the SHA-1 format or using a DER format. And there's also a custom TPM structure, which we do not recommend. Uh, fairly recently, somebody discovered that there's a, a flaw in how the TPM puts that together, such that you can, in fact, do collisions that you shouldn't be able to and, and look like you're forging signatures. So we don't generally recommend you use that third option. We'll talk about that in much more detail tomorrow. Um, the TPM will also certify keys. And this is tremendously useful as a uh, function because it means that any key that the TPM creates, we can create certificates for that we can remotely verify are also associated with the same TPM. So and, and it will also certify what, what the properties of that key are, so we know what PCR values a key is constrained to, we know what type of key it is, so we know what operations it can and can't be used for, you know, how many bits long it is. A whole lot of, of properties like that are all included in that TPM credential that it, that it provides. So TPMs are very, very useful for building trust in new keys, 
and in, in keys that meet specific purposes. Um, is that true for both symmetric and asymmetric? The TPM does not let you use any, asy any symmetric keys. They're always a asymmetric. They're always RSA keys. There are technically some symmetric keys that don't even have names inside the TPM, but because of export control regulations. That's reason. Yeah. Um, the TPM also does provide you with your own convenient SHA-1 hash operators if you actually need that. Very few people actually care. You can do that in software, but it'll do it for you if you want. Um, one of the questions we get a lot is, why on earth does the TPM not have generic sign operators or, or encryption operators? Why does the TPM not let me use the same key to encrypt and de decrypt data and to sign it? This particularly comes up for those of you who are familiar with X509 certification protocols. Um, I'll get to your question in just a sec, so you know. Um, oh, actually that's really neat. Do you not point out that the BIOS cares about the TPM doing the SHA-1 hash because then they don't need to implement SHA-1 in the BIOS. That makes perfect sense when you put it like that. Um, so, in the X509 certific certification protocol, the certification request is a self-signed piece of data. That means that there is absolutely no way to use an X509 certificate request with a TPM encryption or decryption key, no matter what kind it is. You may or may not be able to do it with a signing key, because depending on the exact details of the format, and this is where I, I don't really know too much about X509. And you can't do it with the identity key that I talked about earlier. So that a lot of people are really not happy with this constraint because it gets in the way of things like PKI integration. But the reason that they're doing that is that because these are RSA keys and because um, signing with a Signing and encrypting are basically the same operation in RSA. There are attacks that you can have, you can do, if you use the same key for both. And the people who designed the TPM, and this is a theme of the class, they said we're going to do this in the way that is most secure, and we're not going to worry so much about compatibility. So there you go. Um, that, that's why. The other thing is, because these are so specialized, and because I can, if I see that this is a TPM storage key, I know exactly with which operations it can be used for. I have a little chart. It can be used for seal and unseal. It can't be used for bind. It can't be used for sign. It can be used to, to be the, uh, to protect other keys. And that means that I can certify this is a TPM storage key, and you know exactly what that key can be used for so it's much better for establishing trust than this is a generic key. So the TPM also does provide some other useful functionality. Um, it has monotonic counters. These are counters that always go up. Um, this can be very useful if you want to do rollback prevention, both in, in low, yeah, low level, high level, yeah, you know. The time now is later than the time then because you can, you can verify the, the, the tick value. Um, there is a tick counter that is almost but not quite a clock. Um, it's basically established as a certain value on boot and then it, it ticks forward um, until there, there's a reboot at which point it establishes basically a new initial value. Um, it is, the reason we call it not quite a clock is that I can't tell, for example, how many reboots there have been. You know, if I have a tick counter from yesterday and a tick counter for today, I can tell if it's all in the same boot, but if it's a different boot, I can't tell how many reboots there were in the middle. Um, but this can be tremendously useful if you want to do short-term timing, and to some extent if you want to make sure there isn't a reboot, this is one of the things you can use a tick counter for. Um, the TPM will actually sign the current value of that, that tick counter. Um, this is one of those neat little specialty things. Most people don't use it. Xenos found some very cool things that, he, that, that it can be used for, so we're starting to look into it a little bit more. 
The tip counter is basically a two-piece thing, one of which is a random nonce that the TPM generates that is basically this, that you can think of as a session identifier or boot identifier, and the second is number of ticks since, since that started. So, um, the TPM also has something called direct anonymous attestation. And this is a series, this is a set of functionality that is directly aimed at the people who said TPMs are a privacy threat. Because you can identify my machine and I don't want Disney or the IRS or whatever tracking all of my movements using this, this cryptographic chip. Um, direct anonymous attestation is the result. It allows you to do zero knowledge proofs of identity. Which is a very interesting concept when you think about it. Um, so I can prove that I have a TPM, but you don't know which TPM. Um, I can potentially prove I'm the same TPM, but I can distinguish that the two sessions can be associated. DAA is extremely complicated. To use DAA, you use the, like the TPM has basically one command, has several commands, but one of these DAA commands, in order to do one DAA operation, you call that same command, I believe it's 27 times, with different arguments. DAA is massively complicated. As far as we know, it is not in practical use because it is so massively complicated. But it is there to address privacy concerns. It will be there in TPM 2.0, despite being basically unused. Because over in Europe, a lot of the governments there have very strong concerns over privacy, and they want to make sure that the, that the TPM supports that. So DAA is really there as, as what I might call it a liability uh, protection. Um, we're not going to talk about DAA in this class because it is tremendously complicated. I'll be perfectly honest. I stepped through how it works once, and I really didn't get it that well at the time, and I have since completely forgotten about it. So if you actually want to understand DAA, you can go ahead and read the spec yourself, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so that is our quick review of what the TPM does. Are there any questions on this section before we go on to the rest of the TPM 101 presentation? Awesome. I hope you're not asleep. I worry sometimes when I'm, when I'm providing this much data at once. Okay. So one last piece, which is ownership. I've said several times the TPM owner can establish NVRAM, or the TPM owner is the only one who can create an identity key. I don't know if I actually told you that before, but it's true. So what do I mean by ownership of the TPM? Um, the TPM has an owner, which is usually, but does not need to be, the physical owner of the machine. Um, ownership of the TPM is a technical term that has nothing whatsoever to do with who paid the money to acquire it. But that said, in a corporate setting, an enterprise setting, we usually expect the owner to be the IT department. This is not quite the same thing as like root or administrator access, but it's close enough that we generally expect the IT department to want to, to have that control. That said, it could be the machine user. It's not going to make too big a difference. Someone needs to take ownership of the TPM in order for the TPM to be used. It's the first operation you, you do when you're actually making use of the TPM. is something called take ownership. Um, in order to take ownership, you should have physical presence, which is to say you should actually be sitting in front of the machine. That may or may not actually be required, but it's the intent. Um, certainly, you need, take, you need physical presence to remove the previous owner. Whether you actually need it to take ownership is a little shakier. Um, you asked earlier, so when are these root keys created? Do they come with the TPM? Well, the storage root key is created when you take ownership. Part of the ownership operation is create a new storage root key. When you remove the previous owner, the old storage root key is erased. So that does mean anything protected with that storage root key is gone. So an owner is in some ways the one who is, you know, the, the that establishes the life of data associated with this TPM. Now, this can be tremendously useful in enterprise context because I can say, right, we're disposing of this machine. 
I'm going to remove the owner, that key is erased. Now everything protected with that TBM is now junk data. Just like that. On the other hand, there is now a, an evil bait attack because anyone with physical presence can in fact erase the owner. So some, you know, an evil maid comes in, clears your TPM, and whoops, you don't have your data anymore either. So we do generally recommend locking down your BIOS if you're going to be using this for that reason. Um, the owner does have administrative privileges. For example, you can change certain configuration settings that the TPM has that we'll get to a little bit later. They're, they're pretty minor, um, most of them. They can establish regions in NVRAM and, and puts data in them. They can create identities. Um, but the owner does not, this is not root. Administrator here does not mean free access to all other data. The TPM owner has no ability to, you, you know, you can't use the owner password instead of a key's authorization value. The owner cannot say use this key even though the PCRs do not apply. The owner, if, if a certain region of NVRAM is, is set to um, authorization value permissions rather than owner permissions, the owner can reset that, that region, but they can't just read it freely. So ownership is not nearly as security critical a feature in TPMs as root access or administrator access is in your OS. So this is one reason that, although we usually tend to recommend to give it to the IT department, the main reason for that is because it's the first thing you do with your TPM and it makes certain provisioning processes easier. If you were to, you know, if, if we, as a, you know, I as a corporation said, Every TPM in the entire company is just going to use the company name as the TPM's owner password. That would just mean that all of the people in the company could establish regions of NVRAM freely and create identities freely. It's, there's very little that an evil owner can do if you are for, for most applications. So, you don't generally want to do it because, you know, sometimes we do care about things like NVRAM access, but it's not as though they can freely read private keys or anything like that. So it's not something we worry about nearly as much. So identities are a specific kind of key called an identity key or an AIK. We use all of these phrases interchangeably. These are not identities in the sense that people who do identity management talk about identities. These are, and this is a technical term for a specific kind of key that is used for um, reporting on TPM state. An identity key is what we use for things like a quote or for certifying other TPM keys. So the reason that the owner has the exclusive right to, to create these is going back to that privacy uh, concern that, that, that caused DAA to exist which is the, the privacy advocates fairly reasonably said, I want to be the one to decide whether Disney and the IRS or, or Microsoft know that I'm the same person or not. So that, that's each of those can, you can create as many identities as you like or even have one identity. In the corporate context, we, or enterprise context, we tend to assume you will have as many identities as are really needed for visibility. So you might only get away with, you know, if, if everything in the enterprise is within that same enterprise and you're, you know, you're using some kind of unified identity management system or unified PKI, you probably only have one identity because you only care. On the other hand, if I am working in my enterprise, but I also am working with Microsoft on the outside, or the US government on the outside, or um, you know, Britain, I might use different keys for each of those so that, that you know, Microsoft and Disney don't know that I'm also talking to the US government. You know, if I decide to use, you know, if the IRS says, we're going to set up an e-file system and you can use your TBM to, to sign your, your tax return. I probably do want to use a different identity for that than 
when I am on the internet downloading my, my you know, slightly sketchy movies. So there are reasons that you may want to use different identities. They are most relevant if you care about privacy, but we can also use them for permission management or access management to say, uh, you know, you're only working at this site for the next 60 days, so we're going to issue a short-term certificate for this identity, and then your long-term identity for general corporate resources is going to be, you know, three years. So there are things you can do that, that are neat with this trick, but for the most part, all you really need to know is the owner has that permission. If you are giving it to the IT department, one of the things you can do with owners is actually delegate permissions. And each individual owner permission can be delegated. Pretty good password. So if there's a specific owner function that you want out of the hands of the IT department in the hands of the user, you can control that in a much finer grain than just saying you're the owner if you want to. Is this only related to that direct anonymous attestation, or is this some completely? This is completely unrelated to direct anonymous attestation. Um, we will talk a lot about identity keys and how to use them, because we can do great things with them. DAA is an order of magnitude more complicated. Several orders of magnitude more complicated, and we're not really going to talk about that. 